so that anyone who can't join us now will be able to watch the recording of this session, which I will upload onto the RU Connected site um, within the next day or two. So, welcome to you all. Let's have a look. Let's see. I know that we might break the internet if we do this, but let's start off by seeing if we can all just wave hello. Um, if you can all just uh, turn on your cameras. Let's have a quick look. I can't seem to see. Where can I see everyone's faces? Um, oh, is my camera even on? Gosh. The internet is definitely working against me yesterday and today. Determined challenge. Wow. I don't know why I can't see everybody. Ah, there we go. Ah, there we go. Hello and greetings to you all. At least now I can start to see some people. There we go. Hi. Welcome to all of you. Um, I don't know. My camera is just a blank. I don't know why that is. Maybe not a bad idea, actually, because in a moment of madness, I dyed my hair blue for the lockdown. So it's probably a good thing that you can't see me right now. Anyway, it's good to see some faces. And I'm going to ask you now to turn off your cameras just to reduce the bandwidth. Um, I'm told that if we turn off our cameras, it makes it, um, let me turn off my own camera, it, it makes the bandwidth a little bit less. But a very big welcome to you all. The purpose of this morning session is for Susan van Skalkveig and myself to just talk you through the course, um, the structure of the course, the purpose of the course, and how we're going to work together. Future sessions in which we meet up together online are going to be more... Um, content driven and we'll have guest speakers talking about their own experience doing knowledge syntheses and guiding us through the very varied methodologies that you can use for knowledge syntheses. So today's session is very much introductory and an introduction to the course. Hopefully you have all been able to access the course on Are You Connected? If you have not, if you've been onto Are You Connected and the course is not visible to you yet, or if you have never used Are You Connected, then um, you should get an email from EdTech to help you. But please do drop me an email if you have any problems. Um, I think it's quite important that you get online sooner rather than later. So please, in the next day or two, preferably today, can you try to go on to Are You Connected and just check that your connection works. And if you have any problems whatsoever, drop me a line and I'll get our lovely EdTech colleagues to assist you. So, who are we? Um, two aging and longus. Um, and you'd think that the fact that we're aging means that we bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise. Well, if you've already watched our introductory video on Are You Connected, you'll see that that's certainly a lie when it comes to me. I have very little experience in this, but I was requested to put this course together. And that's really all I've done is put it together um, to try and make a space for us to learn together. I'm very keen to learn. Um, I've spent the last couple of weeks trying to learn a bit so that at least I can put the course together, but I'm very much a novice. Um, many of you in the group have much more experience than I do, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning with you. Um, as you will have seen from our little introduction video, Susan has more experience than I do. She's currently working in the um, in, in medicine, in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch University. And you will note, if you haven't already, that a lot of knowledge syntheses, the methodologies emerged from the health sciences. So when she joined the health sciences, um, she was exposed to these different methodologies and very quickly started to both partake in the in studies using such methodologies and to supervise studies using such methodologies. 
So that's who we are. Um, but I know that it's it's quite um, fashionable for academics to sort of say, oh, we're all going to be learning together. Um, but this time I genuinely mean it. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to participating um, alongside all of you. So this morning, oh, so you know who we are. So this morning, let's quickly find out who, who you guys are. There are 48 of us in total in this group. Um, there's only 33 of us online at the moment, but there's 48 that are registered for the course. As I say, I know that a lot of people have indicated that uh, they aren't able to get online this morning. That's why we're recording it. And where do you come from? Well, a nice spread across um, faculties. The biggest group, 38% of you come from humanities. Um, and then the second biggest group comes from commerce. The smallest group actually comes from pharmacy. But I think that's because when I spoke to many people in pharmacy, they said that they were already using um, various forms of systematic reviews. And so we're probably a few steps ahead of the rest of us. Commerce, uh, especially management and marketing um, studies around the world are increasingly using these methodologies. But I'd say it's relatively recently that some of these methodologies have been picked up in the fields of humanities and social sciences, which includes education and, um, uh, and law. So yeah, the scientists um, generally that the, the um, have been using such methodologies fairly regularly. Yes, sorry, second biggest is science. Did I say humanities? I think I might have said it the wrong way around. Yes, second biggest is science. And certainly, um, I think, although generally as a methodology, all of these methodologies can be considered fairly new, all of these different forms of knowledge synthesis can be considered fairly new, they are slightly older in fields of health sciences and um, sciences more generally. So that's who you guys are, a real spread. Um, the other portion, 10% of you are other, and the other portion are primarily um, people working in the library, which is absolutely wonderful. I'm really pleased that we have so many of our library colleagues with us as participants in this course, because one of the things that will become so self-evident as we go through is the need to work closely with librarians. If you are doing desktop analyses of pre-existing, of existing research, you need to have very strong skills at using databases and setting up appropriate searches and so on. So I'm extremely grateful that so many of our librarian colleagues have joined us as participants in this course. Another look at who we all are in the group. The biggest group of you are um, PhD students. Um, and then um, we've got master's students, 12%, 16% of you are honours, 18% of you are academics who are supervisors, perhaps you're supervising people doing various forms of, of um, knowledge synthesis, or perhaps you as a researcher are starting to use these methodologies yourself. And then we've got these others who are, again, postgraduate, postdoctoral fellows, people in the library, people doing postgraduate diplomas, technical officers, and so on. And I think that one of the riches of this course is that there is um, an opportunity for us to talk across our disciplines and to learn across disciplines. Isaiah, I see you saying that you cannot hear any sound. Um, you might just need to adjust your own audio settings, um, find your volume, turn it up. If none of that works, I would suggest that you probably need to press the little down arrow next to the microphone and select a different um, speaker, perhaps. And if that still doesn't work, you know the story, exit and come back in and come back in again, turn it off and on again, as they say. What I'm going to ask you to do just for five minutes to find out a little bit more about who is in the room, can I ask you in the chat bar, I hope you can all find the chat bar. If you can't, click the three dots more on the menu, open the chat bar, and I'm gonna ask you all to pop into the chat bar in a sentence or two, the topic or phenomenon or issue or concept that you are interested in researching or that you are already 
busy with researching. So let's hear from all of you. If you can be busy typing away into that chat bar, just a sentence or two. Thank you, Morgan. Um, head of the crowd, the barriers and enablers of conservation agriculture among smallholder farmers. Karen, pre-service teachers in multiplicative reasoning. Wow, okay. Clearly, I don't have that reasoning, I can't even say it. Music heritage and the ocean, teacher education from a critical realist perspective, uh, sexual and reproductive health of young women and other marginalized people, effectiveness of different MSD prevention and management techniques. Ulrico, what is MSD? Is that multiple sclerosis? I'm guessing. Now, uh, flat plain fisheries and livelihoods. Um, it's wonderful to see this vast array of interests. Are vascular mycorrhizal fungi associated with wheat under conservation and conventional agriculture? Right. Fungi. Ecological African connectivity barriers and corridors, evaluating learning in degraded environments. Hmm, all these interesting terminology that obviously have very specific meanings for you. It looks like an English word to me, but I'm not sure that I have the same, which is one of the things I think which is quite interesting about research. I look at the word vascular mycorrhizal fungi, and I know that I don't know what that is, other than a vague understanding of what fungi is. But when I look at ecological African connectivity, I understand what each and every word is, but I don't know what that means collectively. Same with Mondes, degraded environments. I know what degraded is and what environments mean, but I don't know exactly how it's being used by you. Not that you need to explain it now in the chat, but I just think that's an interesting phenomenon that in some fields we use ordinary English words, but in very specialized ways. Chi Chi, testing the anti-diabetic and anti-Alzheimer effects of Vanadian complexes in vitro. Wow, interesting. Communal rangeland management, James. Uh, oh, sorry, El Rico. Muscular skeletal disorders. Great, thank you. Gender differentiated use of natural resources in coping with climactic shocks. That's so young or young. Um, the clout of peripheral knowledge dimensions on the quality of civilian oversight. Hmm, thanks, Wisdom. Um, Alana, African musical arts teaching outside of the formal school environment. A collaborative approach to developing teaching strategies to improve English home language and multilingual foundation phase classrooms, online indigenous well being seeking behaviors and strategies, drought risk and livelihood vulnerability of small scale farmers, attack from our own devices. Sure, nice title. A, SAT, a cyber security awareness model. I almost feel like I don't want to know. I don't want to know who's watching me. It does freak me out when I mention something to my husband and then suddenly Facebook offers me a whole lot of suggestions on that exact topic. Um, and Tony, I'm supervising a study on the development of financial well-being framework for students. Very interesting. Very interesting. I've seen so much discussion about that on Facebook at the moment. Kelsey, the role of community support for Alcoholics Anonymous in rehabilitation and maintenance of sobriety from an anthropological perspective. I've wondered a lot about um, how it is that alcoholics who are either active alcoholics or who are in remission, I wonder how they're coping with the sort of heightened conversations around alcohol in the country at the moment. Isaiah, mediating electricity conversation through code signing or co-designing. <laughs> okay, I think it's co-designing. Uh, pharmaceutical vulnerability and import dependence. Hmm. And the use of music therapy for victims of GBV. Um, grievous bodily violence. Faculty librarian, thanks Linda, supporting for humanities and education students and staff. Welcome to you all. I think and I hope that you've all very quickly seen the incredible wealth of interests and topics and the varied positions from which we come together 
as what I hope will be a very supportive community to look at this set of methodologies collectively known as knowledge syntheses. And Dominique's um, also interested as a supervisor to sort of figure out how we can best support our students. Great. So why do we need knowledge syntheses? Susan's going to take us through a little introductory in a, mo in a moment, but I thought I should just say, tell you that the reasons why the Center for Postgraduate Studies was specifically asked is twofold. Firstly, it is a growing body of methodologies that are increasingly being used not only in the health sciences but more broadly so in fact we offered we ex we offered a, um, a short course on knowledge syntheses and specifically on um, systematic reviews two years ago um, and there was already a lot of interest in it then. But now with the coronavirus, a lot of people have realized that they may not be able to collect um, primary data themselves and undertake an empirical study of that nature. And so they wanted to, to look at how they could undertake an empirical study using secondary data in the form of um, existing published journal articles, book chapters, books, um, uh, PhD theses, master's theses, grey literature, such as policies and reports and so on. And so a lot of people are now saying, how can I make this year work for me? And that in a way has been, I'd say, a big driving force. But there's not only, I could say, that almost negative push towards us all learning about this. I think there's also a very positive push towards people undertaking knowledge syntheses. And that is what I consider almost my, one of my personal, what can I say, um, political campaigns, is that it worries me that universities are being framed in this so-called knowledge economy to publish, publish, publish. And any of you who are academics will know the pressure on you to publish, and possibly even as postgraduate students. You told you need to get publications, you need to get publications. I keep telling my students, we don't need publications. There are too many publications. If I told you you could do nothing but read the publications in your field for the next month, you still wouldn't be able to keep up with all the reading that is already existing. So my concern is that the pressure to just publish for the sake of getting publications is very perverted. And it stopped us understanding that the purpose of publishing is actually to disseminate knowledge, to contribute to a conversation, to help build knowledge. Um, and the consequence of that is that we have this mass of publications that none of us can ever get through. And some of it is of very dubious quality because not only are academics being pushed to publish, but the journals are being pushed to get more and more publications out there. And many countries around the world actually have part of their funding formula um, and their reward systems and their ranking systems around academic publications. So there are some perverse incentives for people to publish absolute rubbish. Um, sorry, I'm being crude and bold, but this is, this is what I feel. And the two consequences of this are that we can't, we don't necessarily use the publications that are out there and people may be repeatedly saying the same things, but we can't stop long enough to learn from each other. And the other thing is that a lot of stuff that's getting published is really not very useful in building the field. So I feel that that is just one of the reasons why we need knowledge syntheses. We need to pause to look at what's there, to bring it together into conversation with each other so that we don't just have this pile of articles on a topic, but we actually look across these articles and say, well, what's the conversation? What's the contribution? Which articles should be given more weight and have more value and which are problematic and for what reasons? Um, so for me, that is a very good reason why, regardless of coronavirus, we should all consider looking at these methodologies and finding the ones that can help us really move forward, the, the, move our fields forward, because that, after all, is the knowledge project, to contribute in meaningful ways to knowledge. And this, I think, has the potential for each of us to make very meaningful contributions, to just pause, stop, 
and look at what exists and evaluate it and bring it into conversation with each other. So the, here are a few of the reasons I'm not going to take too long, but um, that it, the, this slide is, is up. Um, you'll find um, all of this is already on the RU Connected website. But of course, there's lots of other reasons why we should consider knowledge synthesis. No single study, even a big study like a PhD, can actually say, you know, this is the word and it's over, full stop, and nothing more can ever be said on an issue. Um, and so it's important for us to look across issues, across publications. Um, a well-conducted review, which I'm hoping all of us will end up being in a position where we can at least think about undertaking a well-conducted review at the end of the course. A well-conducted review will allow us to plot out what is the dominant thinking, to be able to really pull out the dominant themes, the dominant voices, the dominant methodologies, and be able to either critique them or to be able to evaluate why these have come to be dominant. Often when we are doing um, literature reviews, and we all do literature reviews, in any study you do, you do a literature review, but most of us, the, uh, the way in which we access the body of knowledge, the literature, is haphazard, and it's influenced by personal preferences. So our supervisor says, oh, you should read this, or, or we've heard of that person, or we met this person at a conference, so we read their work, and then we see that they're referencing someone else, so we go and read that work. And it's kind of haphazard, and often that's good enough. It gives you a general feel, a general feel of what's going on in the literature, and that's probably good enough for many studies to say, well, this seems to be the conversation in the field at the moment, but it is haphazard and it is very subjective. And um, if you were doing this research in a different um, geographical area, you might look at very different literature on the exact same phenomenon. So having some kind of methodology that forces us to be a little bit more systematic about the process of what it is we look at and how it is that we find the literature that we're going to look at is surely a good thing. And often we've got a lot of conflicting studies. We've got studies on the exact same topic that come up with completely different um, findings, recommendations, conclusions, and we're not bringing these together to see, well, what's the conversation between them? How is it that they are offering conflicting advice? And if I think about some of the um, uh, um, studies, systematic reviews and meta-analyses that I've read in the medical field in the last few weeks, a lot of them will say, they will look at things like, um, well, who did the study? Because if it's a study that was undertaken in the laboratory of the company that is making the drug that is being researched, um, without there necessarily being any um, dubious bad science where people are actually um, manipulating data, maybe they were completely um, appropriate and proper, but they would be blinded by their um, beliefs about the drug that they're gonna make a huge profit from and therefore perhaps the methodology will be skewed in favor of the, of the funders that have an interest in that drug. And a study done by an entirely independent group might therefore follow methodologies which um, reveal negative side effects more, for example. So that might be one of the things you look at, is who's paying for, um, for the research. Another thing, um, especially in the medical field, is often to do with the size of the study. So you have a study that had five people who, who took a drug and said that it gave them uh, that it definitely worked and it's fabulous. Um, and then you have another study of the same drug where it's 500 people and half the people were given the drug and half were given a placebo. Surely these two studies are not of equal weight. They followed very different methodology, one much more rigorous than the other. So we need to bring these together in conversation and be able to say which we hold to be more powerful and useful. Um, and often in many fields, particularly my field in education, a particular methodology is implemented quite differently. We might all be talking about phenomenography, but we do it differently. We might all be talking about narrative research, but we do it differently. There isn't a complete um, agreement about the steps to be followed within, especially in the more messy social science methodologies. Um, and so bringing together a whole lot of studies using a particular methodology would allow us to see how that methodology is used in different ways and to make some commentary on that. 
and again a, a subject a, a particular concept i was talking about that just now that you all have these interesting concepts and um, research concepts that you put into the chat you could just take one of your key concept terms and look at how is that concept used in the literature in some fields there's absolute agreement and we all know that h2o is water and it's two particles of hydrogen and one part particle of oxygen you don't need a hundred studies to figure that out but in other fields there can be a lot of debate um, about what is the meaning of um let me try and find one of your public resource management there we are i'll use clayton's at the end there there'll be lots of different literature that all use that term public resource management but use it in very different ways and sometimes possibly even contradictory ways same with social accountability monitoring so there's another reason why we might want to pause pull together a whole lot of literature in a very systematic way and figure out how is that concept being used and is it problematic that it's used in different ways what are the outcomes of the time that we're going to spend together? Well, it's very much a structured space for self-guided learning. I've already put my cards on the table. I'm no expert, um, but um, I have worked with Susan to pull together and with various other academics at Rhodes University to pull together materials, some of which are already on are you connected site and others we are still editing videos that various academics have done for us and so on so they will be added as we go but we do hope by the end of the course that all of us me and you will be able to at least have a sense of what are the different ways in which people pull together knowledge synthesize them in different methodologies, whether it's a realist synthesis, a systematic review, scope and review, narrative, meta, and so on and so forth. That by the end of this, would at least have some sense of the different ways in which these terms are used. Sadly, some people use the same term to mean two different things. So it's not gonna be a simple process, but together we'll, we'll kind of get a handle on that. We'll also hopefully at least understand the basics of these different methodologies. And we'll hopefully be able to say how each method might be beneficial, might be appropriate for your particular study, and also how each has its uh, shortcomings. We're gonna look at the criticisms of these different methodologies, and hopefully you'll be in a position at the end to be able to say what's the pros and cons of each. And very importantly, we'd like you to be able to read these various reviews in your own field. So you'll be able to find a meta-analysis or a systematic review or what have you about um, um, music therapy or about pharmaceutical vulnerability. And you'll at least be able to read them making sense of the methodologies that those authors have met, have used. What's the course structure? Well, we're gonna to be together for five weeks. The first four weeks, and some of you may choose to only be with us for the first four weeks, that's perfectly fine. That's very much the co-learning weeks. We will, you will find on the Are You Connected site, bits of literature to read. You'll find lots of videos with more being made and added all the time. Some of the videos we've taken off YouTube, some of them we're making ourselves. You will find that there's a forum discussion each week and we really ask you to use those forums. Pop in, tell us what you're up to, tell us what you're thinking. Some weeks there'll be specific questions for us to answer on the forums, but anytime it is very much a space that we're hoping will be will be very lively. And then we'll have these Zoom sessions once a week. Those of you who want to obtain the Rhodes University short course certificate, you would then need to do the last week as well, where we'll be talking about the assessment and we'll have a, um, a Zoom meeting and then you'll go ahead and do your assessment for the course. So we are registering, we're in the process of registering this course as a Rhodes University short course. Those of you who do the assessment and meet the assessment criteria, you will get um, an official Rhodes University short course certificate. So if that is something that you would like, um, you, you would like the certificate or you would like the benefit of doing the assignment and getting feedback on this that assignment, then you will join us for the fifth and final week, and the assessment gets done thereafter. Um, I know I'm gonna sound like, I told you I'm gray-haired and longer, I'm gonna sound like a real gray-haired now because I sound like my mother. 
um, you, uh, I'm going to give my little mini lecture. You only get out what you put in. Um, I think that's even more true of online learning than face-to-face -face learning. Face-to-face -face learning, you can kind of figure things out, not quite through osmosis, but just from being around and having casual chats with others in the class. Even if you doze through half the lecture, you can kind of figure out what's going on. But in, in online learning, it's very much up to you to get online as often as possible to work through the materials. It's all at your own pace. You can do it when it suits you, but you kind of have to get online and do it. Um, and I think it requires a lot more self-discipline and resilience than face-to-face -face learning. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but that's what I've experienced. I strongly advise that you all keep a notebook right from the get-go, whether it's a physical notebook or a Word document or, or a folder in your, on your um, hard drive where you keep all the materials from this course, but most importantly, where you keep your own personal notebook, where you are writing notes. So as well as conversations on the forum with the rest of the group, you're writing notes as you watch a video, jot down some thoughts on that video. As you do a reading, jot down some thoughts on that reading. I'm a firm believer, my own research is in, um, my own PhD was on looking at academic literacy. Um, I know the research that the more you're writing about your thinking on your academic work, the stronger your own writing becomes. So this is not writing for someone else's eyes. It's not pretty writing. It's not beautiful English. It doesn't have to be in English. Um, in any language, it doesn't have to be in full sentences. It's a thinking space, but it's a thinking space in which you write. And then um, finally, just to let you know that if you can't make any of the Zoom sessions, we will record them. So that's the end of my sort of granny lecture. Um, but I, I'm not going to talk much about the assessment now um, because we will talk about the assessment in that final week and you'll be able to see already this information is on the website. But basically we want to make it that you can do the assessment that will suit you. As long as you can show that the way you're doing your assessment will meet the outcomes of the course, we are open to a discussion of anything. You know, you might want to... Um, you might want to set up a protocol for a particular study. You might want us to give you feedback on a draft proposal that you're writing, as long as it meets the outcomes of the course. So please um, think about that and think about what form of assessment will meet your needs. This is your course. If, you're not, if you don't want to negotiate your own particular form of assessment, then it will be an essay of six to eight pages. And we've suggested that you could choose from any of these three topics. The first one is, um, just to o an overview of knowledge synthesis as a methodology, how are knowledge synthesis used in your own field, what are the difference, you know, what are the pros and cons, um, or you can do a review of a review. So you can get, so that's option number two, get a couple of knowledge synthesis on your own phenomenon or on your own topic and do a kind of evaluation of their knowledge synthesis. How did they do it? What worked? What didn't? What criticisms do you have? What benefits do you think those particular articles have? And the third option is for you to do your own um, protocol. Oh, and a fourth option. I don't know, are any of you doing, perhaps you can just put in the chat bar, are any of you doing the InVivo course, which started last week? If any of you are doing the InVivo course using that, um, using that software to um, to analyze data, you could certainly do the same assignment. Obviously, it'll be, it'll be examined, it'll be assessed from a slightly different perspective because Nompila will be assessing it from the extent to which you understand the use of the software. And we'll be assessing it from the extent to which you will use, you are using Viva to actually undertake knowledge synthesis, whether it's the option of evaluating pre-existing knowledge synthesis or starting to develop a protocol for your own. So that's another option is that you can use the same assignment um, but we'll just need to make sure that or, because we'll be assessing it for different course outcomes. I think I've probably as usual gone over time but that is it from me Susan. I'm now going to ask Susan to take over, Susan van Skalkbeck um, and she is going to, I think if you've got a, a screen to share Susan you're welcome to go ahead and she's going to take us through an introduction to the entire notion of knowledge synthesis. Thanks, Sue. Morning, everyone. Um, it would be helpful if you could just let me know when you can see the screen. Yeah, we can see it. It's not on you full can... screen yet, but we can see it. Okay, okay. So I can go ahead there. 
Okay. Perfect. Good. Right. Okay. So morning, everyone. And um, first of all, I need to say a big thank you to uh, Sue and to Rhodes for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm, it's just wonderful to see all the different uh, topics and ideas represented by all the participants. Um, and uh, uh, also, really good to see that I think our numbers, Sue, have gone up to about uh, um, 40 now. So, so almost everyone is, is in the room. Um, I can't see the chat when I show the, uh, for some reason it won't, it won't let me see the chat at the same time as going through my slides. So, Sue, if you could keep an eye on the chat, if anyone raises a hand or wants to ask something, I'm very happy to stop. Um, but the idea of this short presentation is, is just to, to introduce us to the idea of knowledge synthesis. And you will notice um, that uh, Sue's been talking about knowledge syntheses in, um, in the plural. And the reason for that is because in this course, we are going to be looking at many different types of knowledge syntheses approaches to knowledge synthesis. So the synthesis of knowledge. So again, interesting um, how, we, how we use words differently. Um, but I wondered where we should start because in a sense, Sue has already, I hope, convinced anyone who was still wondering why knowledge syntheses are important um, I hope I hope Sue is now has cleared up that one for you. Um, so I thought it could be important for us to just understand this maybe from a from a more uh, academic perspective, a more scholarly perspective, and to take us back to to Ernest Boyer's work um, in 1990. Boyer, who was then involved with the Carnegie Foundation. Um, published a work called Scholarship Reconsidered Priorities of the Professoriate. And I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Boyer's four scholarships. He spoke about the scholarship of discovery, which is the research that we all do, the scholarship of application in terms of bringing it to bear. And Sue was hinting at that when she was, when she was quite passionately talking about the whole issue around research and doing publishing for the sake of publishing as opposed to thinking about what our research might mean um, in, you know, in society. Uh, the third scholarship, Boyer's third scholarship, was the scholarship of teaching and learning. Now, remember, he was talking about these ideas as being priorities for the professoriate. So in other words, priorities for academics, for people like all of us. And the fourth scholarship was this notion of integration, um, which Magachi and you will have noticed that on the forum we have, have recommended Magachi's 2015 article on varieties of integrative scholarships um, as one of your key readings. Magachi suggests this idea of integration is, is that of intellectual synthesis. And, and I really like that, that idea that it's something that we, that we bring ourselves, uh, cognitively bring ourselves to bear on the, on the literature that is out there. So perhaps a slightly different way of thinking about this work, which has also been described as serious, disciplined work that seeks to interpret and draw together. So, Again, these uh, uh, what what Sue has already opened up in the in the previous um, section, um, you know, the need to pull these ideas together. Many of us work on very small scale studies. How can we make this meaningful for uh, for strengthening the body of knowledge? So the goal is to present the state of knowledge at any particular point in time. And for those of you, I noticed that quite a large number of postgraduate students, honors, masters, PhDs, uh, being able to make a stand as a, as a student as to the current state of the knowledge is, is crucial. You're all aware of that. Many of you might actually be busy with that at this point in time. Adopting a structured approach to 
engaging with the literature out there, um, such as, as is advocated by the different knowledge synthesis, uh, synthesis methodologies, can take you a long way to be able to really make a strong claim as to the state of knowledge at any particular point in time. But, and the last bullet will be really important as we progress in this course, is that considering, the, those of you considering knowledge synthesis must first understand the various types, which is what we're going to be looking at um, in the next few weeks, um, so that you can identify the most appropriate type that will answer your research question. And indeed, in week two, we are going to be looking very specifically at the research question um, and some wonderful work done by one of your own colleagues uh, on that, that we're going to be sharing. So maybe just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're briefly going to look at what is knowledge synthesis, also known, um, you might have also read about it being described as research synthesis. Um, now, the top definition on the screen is, is, is quite an early one. And you will see the um, see evidence of where an approach to knowledge synthesis has come from. So knowledge synthesis is an area of research at that point, and that's why I've highlighted it in healthcare delivery science. And the idea was that it would evaluate and summarize all the available evidence on a particular topic through comprehensive literature searches and advanced qualitative and quantitative synthesis methods. So that is a very uh, conventional and a very um, early way of understanding knowledge syntheses. And there's been a movement from that, as Sue mentioned, um, in more recent times. So the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, you can see they're still in the health sciences context, but focusing on this idea of knowledge translation. So what do we do with all of this? Um, the, the idea that if we can contextualize and integrate research findings of individual studies within the larger body of knowledge on that topic, then we might better be able to use this knowledge, to translate this knowledge into, into um, responding to some of the challenges in, in this context, specifically healthcare challenges that the world is facing. And just as an aside, the, um, obviously with COVID, what one is seeing is an absolute uh, tsunami of, of work being published, some of it very quickly with very rapid review, some of it being published even before review, uh, masses of work coming out. And I, I read a very interesting piece in the, in the Guardian about three, four weeks ago, where a researcher in the field of epidemiology um, was talking about the fact that with all of this work that is happening now, we will need to take a step back and synthesize this knowledge. And the words he used was um, that we're writing a new playbook for how to do things in, in the context of healthcare. And I would argue that in many cases, we are also writing a new playbook in education. Um, even what we're doing now speaks to that new playbook. So just then a couple of, of punchy points to think about what it is. It's all about evidence that is already in existence. So this is really important when you conduct this sort of work is that you do not need to typically get full ethics approval because you're not going to be engaging with primary data, you are going to be engaging with evidence already in existence. It's a lot about a predetermined and explicit method and that's why we will spend time looking at those methods. It's about process, format, guidelines and hierarchy. So there's a lot of structure. And I often say to especially young researchers that that is, that is part of the uh, attraction of conducting knowledge syntheses because um, it's quite a, quite a safe space to function in because you sort of, you sort of know what to do next. There's a, there's a very clear process. 
as opposed to um, maybe those of you who are involved in very qualitative work that might feel very uncertain and very insecure. And ultimately, it looks to strengthen and clarify conclusions that have been made. So strengthen and clarify our understandings, um, as Sue was alluding to, uh, often very useful when you want to really flesh out uh, uh, concepts and constructs that are, are, are very contested in the literature. So why knowledge syntheses? Sue has covered this. I really just wanted to share that one quote with you. They can provide the means to move from reliance on eminence. Sue was referring to the way in which we often go with certain people and certain ideas because they sit well with us. Um, the means to move from that reliance on eminence and experience-based opinion or individual, individual studies to using holistically what is available out there. And maybe, um, and you'll hear about Cochrane collaboration going forward, but um, the idea that science should be cumulative in some ways. So the results of a particular study, we need to be, uh, if we want to come with more confidence to interpreting the, those results, then we often need to consider them in light of, the other, of other studies that address the same or similar questions. Now, you might be saying at this point, well, hang on a minute, Susan, that's what we do all the time. When we engage with a literature review, we weigh up the different voices, we bring to bear the different voices. But the difference when you are following the specific methodologies that fall within knowledge syntheses is that you do so in a very structured way. And so your biases, your preferences, your positions are somewhat bracketed. And note the word somewhat. In any case, we will talk more about Cochrane and some of the other organizations internationally that, that promote this work. So in, in summary, it's all about the value and the totality of the evidence. Some studies are too small. The design and quality of the research varies and the access is often haphazard. And Sue has, has addressed most of these things already. So just a last few ideas, just to remind you where this has all come from. Um, I, mentioned uh, the primary healthcare context a little earlier, uh, but this is from a 1997 publication. Um, this notion of evidence-based public health. And again, I, I find the similarities between what was happening at that time when the idea of knowledge synthesis was really being foregrounded and what is happening now this need for explicit and judicious use of the current best evidence that is available. So the example that, that we were given earlier regarding um, the suitable medication, the correct regimen, the correct approach um, to deal with a particular disease or health uh, crisis, um, that's where this all came from. But of course, now the exciting thing, I just actually Googled this morning just to have a look again. Um, it's amazing to see how the idea of knowledge synthesis has moved from where it was in 1997 to where it is now and being used in many, many different disciplines um, to strengthen the claims that we can make about the current standing of the knowledge in the field. I think those are the most critical, uh, critical ideas to hold on to. Just to um, emphasize how, you remember I used the word hierarchy earlier, how the ideas of systematic specifically reviews, but also many different approaches to knowledge synthesis sit within the um, hierarchy of evidence um, as, as, uh, as it sits particularly within the health sciences at this moment, you can see that right at the top is the notion 
of a systematic review of a randomized controlled trial. So for some of you, this will make a lot of sense, this idea of building up towards an RCT and then looking at uh, the systematic review of RCTs. For others, this might be less familiar, this notion of, of a hierarchy of evidence. But this is just to remind you where these ideas have come from. So just, um, and I'm going to, to close with this slide because this helps us to think about um, the next couple of weeks. There are many, many different um, approaches or methodologies that now fall within the broad umbrella of knowledge syntheses. Um, and here uh, you can just see eight and I have read articles that have suggested there are up to 14. We won't be covering all of these in detail over the next four weeks, but we will be addressing some of them in greater details than others. Um, so specifically looking at scoping reviews, specifically looking at systematic reviews, um, realist reviews, which might uh, in, in, um, also link to the idea of critical reviews and so on and so forth. Um, so I think what I wanted to just bring to bear in this introduction is to give you a sense of where these ideas have come from and how they have evolved to ensure that we're all on the same page in terms of what knowledge syntheses are and to give you a sense of the, the scope and the depth and the breadth of this topic uh, with a view to where our conversations are going to go in the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to stop there and I think we're going to be opening the floor to some questions and converse, comments and conversations. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so hopefully um, all of you have a sense of what the heck you've signed up for. And we're going to be working through a whole lot of opportunities to read, to talk, to watch some videos, to share ideas, and to build towards using this course for the purposes that you will find most useful. We tried to make it structured enough to be supportive, but not so structured that you're all forced to end up with a protocol using a particular methodology, but rather that you can use this course, design, kind of design a self-design it in, in a way that, that will meet your needs. But of course that will, whichever way you go, whichever purpose you decide for yourself, it will require all of us, each and every one of us individually, to put in the time to kind of check in every day and do a bit of reading and keep your notebook. Um, so yeah. So I think if we can just finish off by asking for some questions and comments. It might be questions about what, what Susan and I have said or just questions generally about the course. Anything that's in your mind, please feel free. James has referred to a paper by Kern et al. Um, which gives an overview of scholarship and teaching and learning 25 years after Boyer's seminal paper. I'm gonna have a look for that. that um, might be interesting. I'm not sure if Kern et al. have done it as a kind of systematic review or, or more just a general literature review, but I'll definitely look for that. Please type in your questions or your comments or put up your hand because there's, um, it's perfectly fine if anyone would rather talk, we can hear people's voices. So if you've got a comment, in fact, it would be great if you put up your hand and then we can, you can unmute yourself and talk, but otherwise tap into the chat bar. Um, while you do that, and I'm hoping that a few of you are gonna do that, um, I should note that, as Susan said, that the, um, the, in the health sciences, it's quite rapidly become a kind of a gold standard that you're not just doing a small scale empirical study, but you're bringing them all together to be able to make some kind of judgment about that particular method or, or drug trial or whatever. And I think it's worth noting that a lot of people are now publishing on these. So they're actually publishing their um, knowledge syntheses. And various journals are open to publishing your knowledge syntheses and um, others are, there is actually a, 
I think Linda's in the room, she can remind me of the title, but I know that we actually subscribe, Rhodes University subscribes to a journal that just publishes knowledge syntheses. So they're actually specialist journals and specialist conferences now. Um, but even if you published um, not in a particular journal, but just in, in a broad journal in your field, more and more people are able to um, publish on this. A couple of questions and if anyone wants to put up their hand to rather talk, feel free. Um, I see that ASUS ASUS is asking can none or previous road students access the course? Um, at the moment not because we've just been overwhelmed and of course the assessment is going to be um, time consuming but I've had so many requests for people to join various you know um, CPGS is offering I think six short courses this semester and I've had so many requests that I'm in discussion about how we could make this possible um, to open it to others but for this particular iteration it's just going to be us um, internal and I'm afraid you guys are the guinea pigs but if it makes you feel any better I'm a guinea pig alongside you um, and that's an interesting term isn't it a guinea pig and that, of course, comes from medical science, where guinea pigs were generally used as the animals on which various medical procedures were tested before they were tested on humans, although apparently they test them on pigs more than guinea pigs nowadays. Right. Um, Thomas says, would it be possible to have a shared folder for us to upload papers relevant to the different topics as we go? Yes, I thought about that. But Thomas, um, I, I, I think that what's really important is that we all absolutely fundamental to doing a knowledge synthesis is, is becoming very adept and comfortable at going onto the library databases. So I'm going to ask you if you can rather um, post in the forum any reference and say, hey guys, I think you should check out this article. And of course, if anyone has problems finding that article, being able to go onto the library database from off campus, that would be an important thing for which we need to seek our libraries, um, librarian support. We all need to be able to access the library from off campus and we all need to learn and we'll learn together. Um, how to use the databases and how to set up searches. But of course, if anyone can't find the writing, that uh, the article that Thomas or someone else has recommended in the forum, then of course we can all just, always just email it to each other. Um, can a knowledge synthesis, Karen asks, uh, straddle more than one kind of synthesis or is it very specific boundaries? I have no idea. Susan, do you want to tackle that question? I was just actually going to try and type in the chat bar, but let me let me answer now that I have got the microphone. Is it is it Karen? Um, yeah. So convention convention uh, dictates that you stick within the process of your particular chosen synthesis methodology. Um, but I even as I say that I say it hesitantly because I. I'm speaking now very much from the perspective of someone who is sort of steeped in the way knowledge syntheses are used in the health sciences, where they, where they um, really own the process and, and um, you know, the issue of quality is very strongly linked to the extent to which someone has actually followed the protocols. And indeed, there are uh, templates and checklists and guidelines that actually assess the quality of systematic and scoping reviews based on the extent to which they have followed the particular process. But having said that, I suspect that as we, as, as this methodology takes, uh, you know, greater root in, in different disciplines, that that might also change. Uh, because people value different things and people see quality in different ways. And that might result in a bit of a morphing of the way things are done. I don't know. Thanks, Susan. Catherine, let me hand over to you. You've got your hand up. Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Catherine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks. Um, I've Sorry, I've only been listening with half an ear because I'm also trying to watch my kid and work at the same time, but, and I'll re-listen to everything, and, and I'm sorry if I'm asking something that was already addressed, 
Um, but when you want to publish a review paper, um, and perhaps you're still quite new in your field or young in your field, um, and you're not, maybe you're not considered an expert or well known out there. Um, how you, do you have to maybe publish with an expert, or does the like when you publish does the peer review process then um, act as that kind of expert um, checking in a way? Because uh, I did, I did ask about um, publishing a, a paper out of my PhD, which I'm still working on, but I kind of got the feeling that it, it might not be possible because I'm not considered an expert in my field. Although I kind of feel if, if the paper, you know, kind of stands up for itself, that should be okay. I shouldn't have to um, necessarily be an expert in the field for many years. Yeah. Um, I'll comment on that briefly and then uh, see if Susan has anything else to add. Um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't make a difference, regardless of whether it's, it's a, a systematic review or, or knowledge synthesis of any kind or any other kind of article, because strictly speaking, um, most journals, not all, but most journals will do a double blind peer review, which means that your, review, your article gets sent to reviewers without your identity, and the reviewers will give you comments without giving their identities, so that both you, you know, that you are not judged on the basis of who you are but rather what your, the quality of your work and that they are free to speak uh, freely without sort of um, worrying about their names. Um, of course, I can tell you the politics of academic publishing is that the editors who send articles out for reviews knows who sends it. And sometimes if, if an article comes from a big name, I can tell you right now, it's going to get reviewed and probably going to get published. That's one of the unfairnesses of academic politics, and but not really something we can go into in any detail here. But generally speaking, that's not the case. Generally speaking, um, I'd say for most journals, it really, it's the quality of your work. Um, and at, depending on the field, um, ha publishing a systematic review is, um, you know, some fields it's still quite new and, and the, the fields are a bit iffy about it. Hang on, what is this? You know, but for most fields, as, as Susan has said, they're actually um, considered very high profile, very um, uh, well regarded. And she's even called it, she's even said a colleague from Canada called it a citation magnet, which makes sense because if you're about to start doing research in a field, what a better article to read and to quote than an article that's pulled together all the literature on that topic and told you what's going on in the field. Field. So, um, so that is worth looking at. And then Linda tells us that the journal, uh, a title of, of the journal is called Systematic Reviews, and that's all it publishes is systematic reviews. Susan, do you want to comment anything about that? The, uh, whether, oh, sorry, just quickly, another thing I should, I, I've been thinking of saying is that a lot of times people don't do systematic reviews of any kind, knowledge syntheses of any kind on their own. Typically, you would actually do it in a team, which may or is something to think about throughout. So typically, you would be working with at least three people. It's you, a supervisor, and a librarian. And so although you might be carrying the bulk of the work, when you design your question, your research question, when you design your parameters for inclusion and exclusion, all things we'll be discussing in the next few weeks, and when you then start evaluating the literature that comes out when you apply those parameters to the databases, you wouldn't be doing it with only one set of eyes. You'd be working closely with the librarian to help tweak the, the searches. You'd be working closely with your supervisor to determine on what basis you're evaluating the literature. And very commonly, it's actually very big teams. There'll be teams of five or six or seven people. Um, and they might meet together fairly regularly, but then split it up and do different aspects. And that's something you could consider, even at honors and um, masters and PhD level, of having a couple of you who are looking at different aspects of one issue so that you can support each other. You're still doing individual studies, but you're collectively um, looking at the literature. But, um, but these are all things, perhaps I'm jumping ahead because these are things we can discuss in more detail as we go. Susan, do you want to comment any further on that? Yes, um, I mean, maybe just to come back to what, to what Catherine was, was saying about, um, you know, the, the potential to publish and all, I mean, we, Sue alluded to some of the politics and the fact that in many contexts, it's still double blind 
peer review. Although I have to say in the field that I work in now in health, in the health sciences, there's less and less of that. But I think rather turn the question on its head. And, 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 and this is again where knowledge synthesis can be so helpful because what, what is already out there and what is your article, whether it is a, a review article or, or whether it's an article based on your PhD and based on the empirical work that you did, the, the issue for the editor and the, and, and the, the, the factor that should be the biggest influence in terms of whether or not it's, it's going to be accepted for publication is the extent to which it adds to what we already know. And very often showing that you have engaged with previous reviews and syntheses and you are able to identify a gap in our knowledge and our gap in our understanding is a very strong catalyst for an editor to think, oh, okay, this is something new, this is something mm -hmm. different. Yeah. So, so perhaps to also hold that, um, taking into account everything that, that, that Sue also, also mentioned there. Um, and, and just to say uh, uh, the issue about working on your own and, and teams and so on, there actually is a, and, and I'm sure there are probably others, but a, a, a program uh, that I have used with a team, we worked on quite a large scoping review and we made use of a program called Covidence, which allowed us to split up the work amongst us. We were working in different countries. I mean, we started off with just under a thousand abstracts that we needed to screen. That was eventually brought down to about 99 articles that we looked at in totality. When you're working with a really big, a big review like that, um, it can be very helpful to, to make use of, of um, some of the programs that are available online. Thanks, Susan. Um, I think it's probably time to wrap up, but I just want to pick up on a couple of little points that others have made in the chat bar. Susan's already replied to Monde about do you have to include grey literature or not? Those are all decisions we'll be talking about more, particularly in the second week where we talk about the research question, because it really depends what you want to find out. You will decide for yourself as long as you can give a clear rationale that your readers would be convinced by of why you're looking at this and not that. So there's no rules, but we will discuss that in more detail as we go. Winnie has described how it can be useful to do this as a preliminary to then going on and doing some kind of um, um, analysis. So what I find interesting, she says, is how it can be used in the discussion section of a thesis as one summarizes what people have done before and how your argument is different and contributed to the field. I guess the different reviews can be put in different sections of one document, for example, scoping for the literature review of the proposal and the systematic more detailed analysis. I think that's exactly what you can do. Um, and in fact, I've seen a number of PhDs by publication where one of the publications is a knowledge synthesis and another publication or two is their own empirical studies. So they've done the knowledge synthesis um, as a preliminary to say, right, I've really in a careful way synthesized the current conversations, the current methods or whatever it is that they've looked at on that phenomenon. And then they move on and do their own study. So they almost use that process to make the gap, to make the argument for their own study. Isaiah asks, what are the demerits? What are the downsides of systematic reviews? We've only heard the upsides. Well, there's lots of downsides and different review types have different downsides. We will definitely be discussing some of those. And Susan mentioned realist um, reviews critical realist reviews and the realist reviews um, have their own methodology but but you'll see that they spend a lot of time um, describing the weaknesses of some of the other reviews so if you want to read some of the negatives you probably it's probably worth looking at some of the realist reviews because they often start by explaining why they do it a bit differently but Susan I don't know if you want to jump in and off the top of your head what are some of the demerits of this approach to you know of a knowledge synthesis approach um, yeah, I think the big thing is it depends where you come from and, and where I, when I say that, I mean, it depends what discipline you come from and, and, and how you, um, how you believe knowledge is constructed and what you value as knowledge in your field. 
So I know that for many uh, of my colleagues who are very grounded in, um, in the social sciences and, and, of, and have, uh, you know, prefer working very qualitatively, the idea of following such a rigid structure, uh, many people balk at that idea and they feel, feel uncomfortable about that and, and, and would regard that as, as being a disadvantage of, of these processes. Um, I think uh, it's, it's hard work. Uh, people, uh, people sometimes think, well, you know, it's just about following the steps. And I think maybe that's what I've been emphasizing. But at the end of the day, and this perhaps also comes back to Catherine's question about, you know, what, 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 makes, what makes this work publishable, what makes this work valuable for the field is of course the depth that you bring to how you interpret what you see as you complete the analysis. Um, and, and so that can, that can be a really complex and long-term task. It's, it's really, really hard work. Um, and then I think it's James has just popped up here that, that negative results are not published and that that's not available in the literature. And I think James, you're raising an important issue there again. And, and, and this takes us back to one of to the advantages of reviews is that they, uh, they allow us, they create an opportunity for us to engage with work that hasn't been published. So um, that gray literature that, that Sue was referring to, but also you can follow up with studies that have been registered and never completed. You can follow up with those authors and find out why that work wasn't, or with those researchers and find out why that work wasn't published. But yeah, I think as far as the demerits are concerned, um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's quite a time-consuming process and, and um, that it very much depends on, on where you feel you sit uh, methodologically and also um, just in terms of paradigmatically, for some people, the process is exactly what puts them off. I don't know, have we, have we lost Sue? Hi, Suzanne. I think it's the power. We've lost power here in Makanda. Oh, I see. Is that... Is I'm speaking or? It's Monday speaking. Oh, Monday. Okay. Yeah, All right, so, so well, I just wanted to alert you. Oh, I see. Okay. So uh, Thomas is also saying they've lost power. Okay. Well, um, I, th um, I know Sue has recorded this. So maybe if there are no other specific questions, we, we are already past the hour. Uh, this might be a good point for us to bring this to a close and to encourage people to make use of the forum if you have any other questions. And I'm also just looking at some of the questions people have posed. I think it might, uh, they are thinking of a couple of references um, that, and resources we might be able to share. So please watch the Are You Connected site. And, um, as, uh, as we move forward over the next couple of weeks and we'll also try to respond to your questions in that way. Um, see, Thomas has been very busy already and he's picked up some tools for us. So I think from my side, everyone, um, goodbye. Stay warm. I don't know what it's like in Rhodes. In Cape Town, it is absolutely freezing. Um, and we didn't have power when we started, but we've now got power. So clearly, um, load shedding is, is doing its thing. Any last comments from anyone before we say goodbye? Thank you, Ilana. I see you uh, find things very exciting. I'm very happy about that. Um, yes. So take care, everyone. Stay safe. And um, we'll talk again next week, but we'll, we'll be in touch online. Bye-bye.